everyone. Um, we've started the Hangout for the monkey business, STEM women on Google Plus Hangout. Um, before we do anything, I have to apologize. My neighbor has decided to cut his grass outside. So if it sounds like there's a swarm of really angry bees outside, that's him. Sorry about that. So we, we decided to kick off this series to feature the different women in our group, in our shared circle. And Erin Erin is a primatologist, so that's really interesting work she does. Um, sorry, I was getting feedback. Um, <laughs> yeah, and Rajni was supposed to join us, but she couldn't because she had a um, thing to do. And Scott Lewis kindly agreed to step in instead. And that's Scott. Hi, and everyone. That's Erin over here, if you didn't guess already. And yeah, Erin, um, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and explain the work you do? Sure. Um, so my name is Erin Kane. Um, I am a graduate student in anthropology at the Ohio State University. Um, so specifically, I'm a physical anthropologist, um, and even more specifically, I'm studying primates. And so primatology fits into anthropology because it's all about evolution, and they're you know our closest evolutionary analogs. Um, and so I'm studying a couple of groups of monkeys in the Ivory Coast right now, trying to figure out why they're fighting with each other. Um, but otherwise, I just you know take classes and I teach and um, work on my research and try and get grants. <laughs> So, so pretty much the job of a normal scientist, except you get really nice vacations with monkeys every now and right. then. Okay. Right. So I'm either in the lab or I'm in the middle of a rainforest somewhere. And what exactly do you do in the lab? What's a day in the life of in the lab like um, for so you? So right now, really, I'm still doing coursework. Um, I'm taking my candidacy exams in um, February, so I've still got a little bit more coursework to do. Um, so I go to class right now. I'm taking gross anatomy, um, and I'm teaching. I teach an introduction to physical anthropology class. Um, so um, basic human evolution stuff and stuff about the living primates. Um, so when I'm not either in class or teaching, um, I'm usually doing um, reading to try and figure out, um, kind of support the the grants that I'm writing um, and prepare for my candidacy exams right now. Cool. That sounds very interesting. Um, so we can start off by asking you what was your inspiration for choosing this particular career? What what made you choose a STEM career and then why primatology specifically? Um, so I've always been sort of interested in sciencey things. Um, I had a sixth grade birthday, or sorry, my six-year-old birthday party was at the um, Natural History Museum at the University of Michigan. I was in it for the dinosaurs, but you know that was like the sort of thing that I thought was really awesome. Um, and um, when I was in um, seventh grade, I guess I had sort of run out of books to get at the library, and my dad told me to read um, Jane Goodall's first book, *In the Shadow of Man*. Um, which is about, in, you know, it's 1960 and she's a 20-year-old British lady and she gets shipped off to Tanzania by um, the Leakies to go and study chimpanzees. And I, that was like the coolest thing in the whole world. Um, and so I finished reading the book and I told my dad this is what I was going to be when I grew up and I told my science teachers this. And, um, you know, that was almost 13 years ago at this point in time and it's still what I want to be when I grow up. So um, it's worth it. That's really awesome. I, I notice you have a monkey behind you watching us. Could you introduce him <laughs> Actually, to us? It's a, it's a chimpanzee, so it's, it's okay. a, not a monkey. Um, okay. The easiest way to tell the difference between apes and monkeys is whether or not they have a tail. Um, okay. Things that have tails are not apes. Um, they're usually monkeys. Sometimes they're lemurs or lorises. Um, but chimps are apes, not, or not monkeys. But you can't actually. Okay. So be before we went on any further, I wanted to um, introduce why we're doing this, especially in, in the month of December, um, and, and featuring the the amazing women over here at the Women on STEM on Google Plus. Uh, the this month, December has been dubbed December. 
to highlight and feature and celebrate the STEM fields and how everybody, regardless of where they live, what their gender is, what they believe, can all be involved in the different STEM fields, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So through the entire month of December, we will be going through with the people from um, Google Science Fair and also partnered with Girl Start, which is a fantastic group out of Austin, Texas, which focuses on getting girls in K through 12 interested and excited about the, the STEM fields. So throughout the entire month, if you go and check on Google Plus using the hashtag DSTEMPER, you'll be seeing many different hangouts, different um, blog posts and discussions going on, even with the communities that just launched the other day. And so you'll be able to get um, some insight into many different STEM fields, whether it be today with biology and primatology, whether it be with physics, chemistry. Uh, we've had places from all over the place, and this is just our way of, of celebrating uh, the STEM fields and getting as many people involved. We will be checking comments from the event page and through any of the reshares going through on, um, on Boudini's post, also on YouTube and on Twitter. If you use the hashtag on Twitter of December, we'll be able to check all of those comments going through. So if you have any questions for Erin regarding her research, feel free to let us know and we will make sure they get directed towards her. Awesome, thanks. Um, my grass cutting guy took a water break, but he's starting again. So <laughs> sorry, everyone, again. Um, yeah, Erin, um, one thing I wanted to ask you is what was your biggest challenge in doing all this work in the Ivory Coast? Because sometimes the areas you go to have quite a lot of civil unrest. Was that a concern for you, especially as a woman going to those areas? And could you tell us a bit what it was like? Um, so yeah, unfortunately, one of the things about studying primates is that most of the places where primates are located are not the most politically stable of places. Um, and so I've, I was supposed to go to the Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire um, a few summers ago, and they had a civil war. Um, and, you know, so it was kind of a bummer for me because I had to postpone my research, but like, it's a politically unstable place. and that's just the way that it works. And, you know, postponing my research is the least of the world's problems. Um, but I was really lucky to be able to get to go when I did. So I, I was there, um, I actually left exactly a year ago um, for my research. So um, it was interesting because there was, there's still a lot of internally displaced people. Um, I work really close to the Liberian border. So like, like 10 kilometers away from the Liberian border. Um, and a lot of the folks in the villages close to where I was working um, are refugees in Liberia in refugee camps or have family who are in refugee camps in Liberia. Um, one of our field assistants, actually, his brother was killed during the Civil War. And so it's something that's really, um, you know, really personal and kind of intense about the field site. Um, and so while I was there, you know, I was making sure that the situation was relatively stable and um, working closely with um, an organization in, in the, um, the capital that sort of oversees um, research and permits being granted in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we were also, there's a big United Nations encampment pretty close to where I was working. Um, and so like they would stop by maybe once a month or so and bring me pineapples and say hello. And that was kind of cool. Um, so the only like scary thing that happened while I was there, um, there are a lot of kind of cross the border um, groups of people who come and there's a lot of political stuff and so they go and they target political um, adversaries I guess and so um, about halfway through my trip seven people were killed in a village pretty close to where I was and they um, thought that the folks the rebels you know ran into the forest um, and hid and so we were afraid we would have to evacuate and um, it was a little bit it was obviously it was scary but um, fortunately everything worked out um, and I think they ended up catching those people, but there's still ongoing violence and ongoing complications. Um, but I really love what I do and the people who I work with are great. Um, and so it's worth kind of having stuff up in the air. You know, at this point in time, I'm still not exactly sure that I'll be able to get back to do my research, um, but we'll see. Hopefully things will stay stable. Well, it sounds yeah. exciting. <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed for you, and yeah, it sounds very, yeah, quite nerve-wracking. Because for me, I work um, in a lab, 
um, yeah, nothing really dramatic happens. Sometimes our minus 80 freezer will go down and that's about it. That's the most exciting thing that happens here. So, yeah, it must be very different for you that yeah, way. It's interesting because I never, I mean, I really like people and I really like the cultural aspect of anthropology as well. So learning about, you know, why there are political conflicts in the Ivory Coast and stuff. But I never really thought about um, having to be so politically informed about where I work. You know, I study monkeys, but I can tell you all about Ivorian politics or Kenyan politics or Peruvian politics because you have to know where you're working and you have to, um, you know, you have to understand the situation that you're in in order to do effective research. So, yeah, it sounds quite crazy. I, I know, at least with my field, a lot of it's now remote. So a lot of the with with astronomy, many of the astronomers actually can access the observatories from across the world. So they don't have to be in these places, and even these places themselves, you know, the, the observatories are pretty safe you know it's yeah. a big building out in the middle of nowhere but it, I don't know if I could handle going out and having to deal with the Civil War while trying to do my research so that's pretty awesome you know not only is the science you're doing really really cool really interesting but you do have to r literally risk your neck going out there and finding all that uh, all that mm -hmm. information going on yeah. I, I wouldn't call it risking my neck or anything but um I mean, it's it's definitely, there have been interesting moments. The other thing that's kind of nerve-wracking about it is that, you know, I'm walking around in a rainforest full of um, leopards and large snakes, and um, sometimes they pop up, but... I would call that risking my neck. I, <laughs> I don't see myself having the potentiality of being attacked by a leopard in my field, so I, I would say that you're, you're doing a riskier job there than me, so kudos to you, because that's yeah. awesome. That's really cool. Have you had any close calls with other things like that? Um, I've never seen big cats. Um, the monkeys that I was studying in March, or, you know, this past year in the Ivory Coast, they um, alarm call whenever they see a particular snake. They, they pick up on gaboon vipers. They've got these, like, they look like rhinoceroses, kind of. They've got these giant things coming out of their nose, and they're really big snakes, and presumably they eat manga bees. And so whenever the manga bees see them, they like mob the group or they mob the snake rather and so everybody runs at the snake and yells and kind of jumps and pokes it until it eventually slithers away um but sometimes they make it slither in your direction <laughs> um so i you know i've never gotten too close to the vipers but um in peru i almost stepped on a, um, a fertilance which is another poisonous pit viper, and that was really scary. I didn't realize he was there, and I jumped across a bridge at Brook, and I saw him rear up, and I jumped back in the other direction. Um, but otherwise, everything has has been okay. So that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the other questions I really wanted to ask you, because in STEM field, it's really important to have. A mentor who can guide you and help you and you know basically a support system what was your support system and can you explain what qualities that other people in these fields should be looking for when they're thinking of okay I need to look out for a mentor what quality should this mentor have yeah definitely so I've been really really lucky um, you know ever since you know seventh grade people have been really supportive and excited of the idea that you know there's a 13-year-old girl who wants to be a scientist or a 20-year-old or a 25-year-old or whatever. Um, so just in general, my, I mean, my science teachers have all been wonderful and my parents have been incredibly supportive because, you know, I'm just rambling about stepping on snakes and fighting off civil wars and stuff. And, you know, I don't have a whole lot of contact with my parents when I'm in the field and I know it's really difficult for them, but they're still like, do what you like to do and it's great. Um, but as far as kind of academic mentors go, um, I've also been really, really lucky. So my undergraduate advisor, um, Dr. Tab Rasmussen, he is a, a paleontologist and he got me a, a work study job cleaning fossils in his lab. And, you know, not only was I just a work study student, but I was an undergraduate and he like listened to what I was thinking and he was giving me more, um, he gave me lots of responsibility and he gave me articles about things that he thought I should be interested in and articles that I was interested in and like really took the time to listen to what I was interested in and to give me opportunities. Um, 
and now my graduate advisor, whose um, name is Scott McGraw, um, is doing you know the same sort of thing. So he basically the sky is open to me as far as what I'm interested in and as far as what he'll support me doing. Um, and then you know they actually back it up, and so he's you know helped me with grant money and. Um, been really supportive as far as, you know, you can do whatever you're interested in and, you know, having the trust in me to, you know, understand that I'll be able to follow through on stuff. So if I was looking for a mentor, I would look for somebody who had, I knew had time to like devote to paying attention to me um, and the resources to be able to, to take the time and to help me get my own resources, I guess. Um, trying to think of something else kind of beneficial to say, but I'll, I'll keep thinking about it and come back to it. Well, and I completely agree with you, Aaron. Um, that's one thing many people don't think about is when you're getting into the sciences, when you're going into your graduate studies and doing your research, the biggest component for your success is having a fantastic mentor. You have support in whatever field and you need to have that support that is interested in what you're researching that will help you along and, and put you in touch with different contacts that will help you out mm -hmm. as far as what, whether it be just writing grants or finding things like that. But it's, it's really crucial that you have this great work relationship with your advisor and other people in your field or maybe outside of your field that will help you along along the way. So as something to think about, if any of you are trying to get involved into the, the STEM fields, is it's it does have a lot to do with, with studying and being a good student, but a lot of it has to do with being able to work well with one another and being able to step out of your comfort zone. A lot of us are really shy people, and being able to reach out to someone and ask for help and see what is going to be the, the best way of approaching a subject, because a lot of times, you know, we don't know where to go. We might have the abilities to go there, but we just don't know which direction to go to. And having that mentor will definitely help you at least direct your path. You still have to walk and do all the hard work, but having someone direct where you need to go is awesome. Yeah, I, um, I had realized the other thing I was thinking of is that um, you know you can approach primatology and really I'm sure any field from a bunch of different theoretical perspectives and a lot of times those theoretical perspectives don't agree with each other and um, another thing that's been really great about my mentors is that even if they are particularly entrenched in one way of looking at monkeys or fossils or something like that they've never like made that have to be the way that I look at things and so you know it's, it's wonderful to have somebody who I know is knowledgeable about looking at something in a particular way but then if I look at it in another way, it's not a problem. It's just a conversation that we can have. Yeah, absolutely. That's really important. My, I was really lucky when I was doing my PhD. I had a fantastic supervisor, and I'm still in touch with her now, um, even though I'm now doing my postdoc. So yeah, these are lifetime relationships sometimes, if you're lucky. And it's good to choose well, rather than choose someone who's too busy to bother or, you know, has other issues with helping people to bring up the next generation of STEM careers. Now, I'm looking through the comments here and um, I'm seeing a few of them pop up, but one of them is actually our friend Chad Haney, and he was wondering about a very serious question uh -huh. that we've been joking around in the past few. But um, you know, my very serious question is how Erin Kane collects DNA samples of the primates she tracks in the wild. So, um, in the past, I've been involved in a, a really cool project that was specifically looking at genetics. So, there's this group of monkeys in South America. Um, that have twins all the time. And that's weird because usually monkeys only have one baby at a time. Primates in general usually have one baby. Um, and so these guys are really, really small. They're about yay big. They're only f maybe 500 grams at the most. Um, and they always have twins. Um, and it's usually it's because it's easy for a fem or easier for a female to give birth to two much smaller babies than one baby that would be like a quarter of its body weight. Um, so anyways, the cool thing about these guys is that they, um, the twins overlap their placentas and they share blood vessels in the placenta while they're in utero. And what happens is stem cells get transferred between these two placentas. Um, and so you can sometimes end up with your twin stem cells building part of your arm muscle or your skin on one part of your body, or sometimes your gametes. 
Um, and so what I was working for a graduate student um, who was trying to figure out how this chimerism, this sort of stem cell stuff um, comes out in their behavior because they do all sorts of really cool behavioral things too. Um, and so for that project, we were collecting a bunch of different genetic samples. Um, so we were putting out these traps basically in the middle of the Amazon. Um, and we were trying to get the monkeys to go in the traps and then we would um, knock them out and take a bunch of different genetic samples. So we would get hair samples um, and fingernail clippings and um, draw some blood and take some fecal samples. And so usually when they get knocked out, they would just poop and we would be able to collect the fecal samples that way. Um, and so that was one way that we were connect collecting genetic stuff. Um, what I suspect Chad is referring to is my project with um, Diana monkey poop, and that's not actually for genetics. Um, I'm looking at hormones in, um, and isotopes in these Diana monkey fecal samples to try and figure out whether or not females are stressed in one group, um, and if they're stressed, if there is nutritional stress or if it's social stress. Um, so I have to collect a lot of monkey poop. Um, and basically, I just have to keep an eye on the monkey and wait for them to poop and then wait for the poop to fall on the forest floor and hope that I can find it and hope that I find it before dung beetles or flies or something else finds it. And then um, we use a very technical method of collection. Um, I have rubber gloves and a coffee spoon and I scoop it up and put it in a vial. Um, and I haven't exactly figured out what I'm doing with it. I might be put, I'm definitely going to be drying some of it so I can grind it up to do isotopes. Um, I'll probably be saving some of it in a, a different solution so that I can um, take the hormones out. But that is the highly technical method of collecting fecal samples. That's awesome. <laughs> can you identify different kinds of stress from that poop? Can you say it's like what different types of stress it is? Not exactly. Okay. Um, so I, what I'm going to be doing, I think, um, is looking at um, the level of uh, fecal glucocorticoids. So you have cortisol that gets, um, you know, released by your body when you're stressed. Um, and um, it gets metabolized and it comes out in your feces as this metabolite. And so um, we know basically why cortisol is released, but it's released um, for social stress, it's released through um, nutritional stress, it's released through a variety of ways, and it's mediated by a bunch of different processes. So it's definitely not a perfect um, way of getting at stress, but it's better than just behavioral observation. So I'm going to be combining that sort of um, hormonal component with looking at behavior. And so um, these are recognizable females. I mean, I know, you know, which female is pooping and I can again, then go and look and see if, you know, she's been harassed a lot or if she's been initiating fights or if she's been displacing people or something like that. And so then I can um, hopefully correlate it in that way. Um, the, the fecal isotope stuff is really cool because, um, so what happens is every um, organism is on basically a trophic level and you can determine what trophic level they are, if they're consumers or primary producers or what, um, based on this ratio of isotopes. And when organisms are nutritionally stressed, they start um, basically metabolizing themselves. Um, and so when they start metabolizing themselves, it looks like they go up another trophic level. It looks like they start consuming themselves as though they were predators or something like that. Um, and so there's been some really cool research with starving penguins. Um, and I just found a really cool paper looking at um, hermit crabs that shows that isotope levels change when you're stressed um, and specifically when you're nutritionally stressed. So hopefully that will work out with Diana monkeys as well. Is, is that sort of stress very common when you're dealing with primates across the, you know, across the world, you know, especially with the different primates you've worked with? Are you seeing a, a trend in stress based on population of humans in the area or populations of different animals in the area as well? Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't really know. Um, you know, it's, it kind of depends on social structures. So like you, you would think that the dominant member of the group, the person who's, you know, um, the top of the hierarchy, I guess, is is going to be stressed because he or she is fighting off advances from everybody else. And so that might raise your stress. Um, but if you're the lowest member of the hierarchy and you have to like fight for your food and that would also cause stress. And so there's been all sorts, people aren't really sure at this point in time 
if there's a, a good pattern to what makes somebody stressed or not stressed. Um, but if you're interested in that, the, the person to look up is um, Robert Sapolsky. Um, I can type his name for Scott. Um, he's a, a neuroendocrinologist at Stanford, and he does really fantastic work looking at um, baboons and how baboons are stressed and being a dominant baboon versus a subordinate baboon. And then what he's found is that your stress actually affects your health. And so there are really clear patterns of you know, dominant males who are stressed who then have kind of poorer health or subordinate males who are stressed and then have poorer health. And he's working to apply that to humans. Um, and so he does really cool stuff. That's interesting because um, during my PhD, I was working in parasitology and I would get sheep samples once a week as well to analyze for parasites. So yeah, it seems like it's a common thing in biology area. Yeah, there's a lot of people doing stuff with um with parasites in, in primatology right now also. Um, and actually that kind of speaks to Scott Scott's question about um, the impact of humans on primates and primate health and stress. Um, so there's been a lot of work trying to figure out, you know, do you see more parasites in um, disturbed habitats and stuff like that? And it looks like you do. And it looks like where there's more um, interaction between humans and primates, they're, they're kind of sharing disease and sharing parasites and things like that, which you, you know, you would expect probably. Oh, that sounds, that's, thank you. That's really interesting. So do do the parasites co-evolve to have two different hosts? Is that how it works? Yeah, I, I didn't Okay. <laughs> Sorry, gardener dude. Um, do the parasites um, co-evolve with the monkey and the human then? Um, I would assume so, but I don't know. I think the best example that, or the best example that I know of is actually um, looking at viruses and so um, HIV um, is actually, it's the, the monkeys that I was studying, the city mangabees, are the, um, the natural host for HIV. They all have um, the, the monkey version of it, which is SIV or semi in immunodeficiency virus. Um, and so at some point in time, that transferred from city mangabees to humans, and now it's you know, equally well adapted for both of these monkeys. Um, although I guess it, it doesn't kill the mangabees, so they must be doing something wrong there. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but. That's awesome. So I, I'm going through the comments again, and uh, Liz Crane uh, comments that I'm watching, though her internet connection is going out lately. But um, you know, even though you have touched on it a little bit, I, she'd like to hear any stories about how you got interested in science and especially primatology. Is there any one big thing that really launched you into it and has maintained your interest in primatology and science in general? Um, well, I mean, like I said, Jane Goodall is really my like push, my impetus. Um, but it's been just really, really cool to see, um, you know, just there's so much. And so I first started out and I was really focused on chimpanzees. And then um, when I was in high school, I got to go and work um, at the Chimpanzee Human Communication Institute, which is in um, Ellensburg, Washington. And they have a, um, chimpanzees there who learn sign language. Um, and so I was like, observing their habitat use and how they were signing with each other. And it was, it was really cool, but I realized I did not want to work with captive primates. Um, so like, check that off the list. Um, and then I realized that there's a lot of primate stuff outside of just chimpanzees. And you know, you don't have to study great apes, um, which sounds like a silly distinction. But um, the people doing research on chimpanzees and gorillas are sort of insular. And there's a lot of work that gets done um, where there's not a lot of consideration of other primates. And so um, for a while, I thought I would be a paleontologist. Um, and then I went to Kenya with my advisor to study um, paleontology. And we were working in this um, really cool site in a desert in northwestern Kenya. Um, and the people were fantastic. And I was working on speaking Swahili. And it was really cool, but I was totally bored with the research. Um, and so I <laughs> checked that one off the list, too. Um, but I've always been really interested in community ecology and how different groups of monkeys are working together um, and how they're interacting with each other. And in Africa, um, usually what happens is you have um, one of this broad group of monkeys called Gwenins. They're like, they're small, they're maybe 
um, I don't know, 12 pounds to 20 pounds. Um, they usually live in trees. They usually live in groups of one male and a bunch of different females. They're usually eating lots of fruit. Um, and there's a version of them in every forest in Africa. Um, and I thought that was just the coolest like evolutionary experiment, right? Because you have a monkey that's essentially the same, um, but you have that monkey in the Ivory Coast, and you have that monkey in Kenya, and you have them in South Africa, and you have them in deserts and tropical rainforests and mountainous rainforests. And so it's a really fantastic just natural experiment to be able to play around with. And people aren't studying them a lot because they're so kind of everywhere. They're sort of, you know, oh yeah, there's a Gwen in here. Um, but I think it's a really great underutilized resource. So that's what's gotten me kind of and kept me interested in, in primatology. I, I find that really interesting too, the fact that there are a lot of them out there that people don't do any research on them. Like, I think that would be, you have this abundance of research to be done. Let's let's go ahead and take advantage of that. I know with with uh, with my field now that we're seeing many different ways of of detecting things like extrasolar planets. Mm -hmm. But so if you have an abundance of something, well, and we don't know everything about it, let's go research it. We have the abilities to do it. Let's do it. I I see the the need for well, there's not many of them left, so we want to find out what's going on. But I think also learning about their genetic cousins somewhere down the line. We need to find out what's going on with the entire group of primates as opposed to just specific ones. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to you know, imply that there's nobody studying Gwenins because there's a bunch of people doing really great work on them. But um, compared to something like capuchin monkeys or, um, you know, there are some monkeys that are sexier than others. Um, Gwenins aren't the smartest of all monkeys. Um, they're not doing tool use like some of the other monkeys. They're not. Um, but they're super cool, um, and you know I think that they're uh, a great group of monkeys, and I'm really glad that I get to do my work on them. The other thing that's sort of difficult is that these guys are arboreal, um, and they're usually up in the trees pretty high, and it can be difficult to study them um, just because you can't really get a good picture of them. And the other thing is that you know, most of them are in Central Africa, where there's a lot of political instability. And so it's hard to kind of focus your research on something where you, you don't necessarily have the guarantee that you'll be able to finish your dissertation. No, that's fascinating. Um, I'm going through, and there's just a lot more comments coming through, which is awesome, awesome. Um, Rajani says hi, and uh, hey, she's really sorry to, to miss the hangout. Um, but she she's asking, can uh, can Aaron tell us something about that intriguing primate skeleton behind her? Oh sure. So this is a chimpanzee. Um, it's a female chimpanzee. Um, we, it's not actually a real skeleton. So this is just a cast that we have in the lab because it looks cool. Um, it does look cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. I had to yell at the gardener guy. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, trying to think of good chimpanzee anatomy things. Um, OK, so here's a cool story about chimpanzee teeth. Um, ch so most primates have really specialized teeth for the diets that they're eating. Um, if you look at chimpanzee teeth, they've got really, they're like um, kind of rounded cusps. Um, they're, they're really bumpy. I'll post a picture of chimpanzee teeth after the hangout. Um, and chimps are eating mostly fruit. They're eating lots and lots and lots of fruit, especially figs. Um, and chimps live in these giant communities of something like 80 some odd animals. Um, and as you might imagine, there aren't a lot of trees that can support 80 chimpanzees hanging out in them and eating all of their fruit. And so chimps have this big fission fusion society where they come together as a group of 80 individuals sometimes, but usually um, they break off into smaller groups of maybe one and female and her infants or three or four females hanging out together or a bunch of males. Um, and so they, ha they like break apart and they come back together and it's all related to what they're eating. Um, and you compare that with something like a, um, a gorilla, for example. Gorillas are eating um, mostly vegetation. Gorilla teeth are, they're like um, uh, scissors almost. They're really sharp. They've got really high shearing crests. And um, vegetation is everywhere. Gorillas can hang out in big groups and just sit and eat vegetation on the ground and they don't have to do this whole complicated social system. And so what the chimps are eating has a lot to do with how they're socializing and how they're able to organize their kind of social groups and their communities. That's really awesome because, you know, me, I'm not a biologist. I, 
I enjoy biology. I find it interesting, but I have no real uh, insight in my daily life on it. So being able to hear about the different types and how their social structure impacts just their eating habits, that's mm. really fascinating to me. Um, because the the only real primates I deal with are people, and I try to avoid them as much as possible. Well, people, so. you, can see our too. you can see our, you know, the things that we're evolved to eat. And if you look back over human evolution, you can compare human teeth and the arrangement of our teeth and thickness of our enamel and stuff like that to a robust australopithecine or something like that. And you can see that our diet has changed immensely. We're eating things that are a lot easier to process. And um, so... We're not the most boring of primates, you know. It's easy to discount humans as just humans, but we're all right too. We are all right. <laughs> Some of us are. I try to be. That's you two are awesome. <laughs> so one of the questions we have from Tommy, who is um, a parasitologist, was, um, "Can you explain what zoonosis is and what are those concerns with your research?" Sure. So zoonotic diseases are those that are transferred between animals and humans. Um, and um, Tommy can tell you much more about the, the parasite side of this and the, the disease side of it. Um, but as far as my like considerations when I'm doing research, um, the monkeys that I'm working with right now um, are not, I, there's no disease that I know of that transfers easily between humans and Diana monkeys. Um, when I was working with the manga bees, um, that was a little bit more of a concern because they do carry um, SIV. Um, but as long as I didn't, you know, attack them and cause them to bite me or something, we didn't, you know, we didn't have any real um, steps that we took. Um, the people who are working in the same forest as I do with the chimpanzees, um, they're really, really careful because chimps are so susceptible to um, human diseases. Chimps get colds, chimps get the flu, um, chimps get polio. Ebola, all sorts of things. So they always work, um, they have masks on, like face masks, so that they don't ever transfer diseases between either human to chimp or chimp to human. Um, the big concern right now, as far as I can tell, with um, human disease transfer, excuse me, back and forth with primates is related to the bushmeat um, crisis. And so um, bushmeat is basically when people are killing um, animals in the forest usually and eating them. Um, sometimes they're killing them and then selling them in markets. Sometimes they're just killing them for personal consumption. Um, and really closely related animals like chimpanzees and gorillas and other primates, it's easy to transfer diseases when you're eating um, something so closely related to us. So that's generally how Ebola, it looks like, makes it between um, human and gorilla populations and things like that. So that's a major concern, but it's not something that I really have to deal with very much. Is it something you have to worry about in terms of, you know, we've all seen um, movies that glamorize, oh, oops, I caught monkey blood, ooh, it's sprayed on, sprayed on my face. Mm -hmm. Now I have mystery disease. Is that something you have to watch out for? Do you have lots of biosafety protocols to guard against things like that? Um, in the forest, I don't. Um, and other than, um, so like when we leave and enter the forest, we um, wash our boots in, um, like in bleach, like before you actually go into the trail from the, um, the research station. Um, and like I said, the chimp people all wear masks. Um, but... <laughs> um, as far as, I mean, I don't really get concerned about it, um, and I don't think that there's anything. I mean, there's so much other stuff to be concerned about that getting a mysterious monkey disease is not on my list. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's on many people's list. <laughs> uh, so, so real quick, we're about, uh, about half an hour into it, so I want to do a quick station identification of what we're doing here. Um, <laughs> I, again, this is the month of December here on Google+, Plus, and so the Google Science Fair and Girl Start have grouped together to celebrate the different STEM fields. A uh, Girl Start is a K through 12 program to get girls interested in the various um, fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so they've grouped together and we're having hangouts on air through the entire month of December. And today we're here with Erin Kane and we're discussing her research on primatology and especially with her Diana, uh, Diana monkeys in Cote d'Ivoire. I have a new question from Erin's mother which is awesome. So hi, Erin's mom. And Hello. she just tells us to ask about anthrax. Is there some story about anthrax I don't know about? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, 
anthrax is also endemic to the Thai forest. I may have neglected to mention this to my parents before I left. Um, and so, I mean, the spores, I, as far as I know, I don't really know how it works very well. Um, the spores make it, um, you know, in, infect fruit, I guess. And then what's happened a bunch of times um, pretty recently is that the chimps eat this fallen fruit um, and then the chimps get anthrax. Um, and so there have been several chimps that have died of anthrax in the past couple of years. Um, and it's, I mean, it's just, it's an endemic thing to this particular forest. Um, so I didn't actually really realize this until I got there and was warned not to pick up any. Um, so sometimes we come across um, skeletons and other, um, you know, like dead animals. And especially if it's a primate, we collect the skeleton because my advisor does a lot of research on functional morphology, looking at how skeletons are evolving and shaped by what the monkeys are up to. Um, and so I was warned, you know, don't pick up the skeletons with your bare hands because you might get anthrax. Um, and so this was, I was warned this after I'd collected my first skeleton. Um, and then I had this like terrible cold, and this like horrible, horrible allergies. And I was like, oh crap, I don't know what anthrax, you know, is this what anthrax feels like? And I'm, my station doesn't have electricity or the internet or satellite phone. I mean, we have satellite phones, but not really good coverage, but I was like, dying for Google so that I could figure out, you know, do I have anthrax? <laughs> um, I think we need to launch Google smoke signals so we can at least have have some sort of connection to the search. And the only, we had a like health resource book, but it was in German. Um, and so I was like, well, I'll just keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> so note for oh. next time is bring an, bring an English medical resource there or learn German before you go. Yes. <laughs> I bet your mom was really worried about that. Yeah, my, I th don't think I realize quite how much stress I put my poor parents under. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, you're not selling me that you're not risking your neck out there. You, you keep saying <laughs> you're not, and I, you haven't sold me. <laughs> um, no, the, I was actually, I was really lucky as far as health stuff goes. I mean, I was allergic to something that apparently fruited in January. Um, but my only other major issue was that I had bot flies. Um, oh. So I had a bot fly in my elbow and I had, or well, I had bot flies in both elbows and one in my armpit. Um, so it's basically, it's a fly that stings you and it lays its larva in your skin. Um, and then the larva live off of your muscle tissue until they're big enough to emerge. Um, and at first I just thought I had pimples, um, like popping up in weird places because it was humid, I guess, I don't know. Um, but then I realized that there was like, they were getting bigger and I could feel the like thing moving in me. And it was like, it was really horrible. I was like, it was right at the beginning of my trip. So I was really homesick and I like couldn't communicate with anybody very well. My French was not great. Um, and so eventually I like figured out that I had bot flies and um, on my birthday actually, I like squeezed one of them out of my arm and it like flew across the room. And I just like sat and was so sad because I was all alone speaking no French, and I had things eating me, and it was really, it was very sad. Oh, then, you know, wow. <laughs> the wow. The thing that happened, that was, you know, the only bad thing, and that was my, I only had those three bot flies, and they all came out without too much trouble, so. That's <laughs> insane to me. I, I, I'm not afraid of bugs, and I'm not really afraid of any real biology stuff, but having having other species of animals coming out of my body is one of those things I'm sure many people have nightmares about. <laughs> so if, if anybody didn't think Erin's research was awesome, she's so hardcore. She's had to go through, go to other countries and continents. And now she's had animals crawling out of her body for the name of science. So you, <laughs> you are awesome. That is crazy. I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't. That would just send me over. You know, I'm not really afraid of, of of flies or bugs or snakes, but I'm pretty sure I draw the line at other animals crawling out of my body. That's that's a pretty good line there for me. Yeah, it does give me some good stories, though. You know, because anthropologists get together and everybody's got field stories. You know, whether you're a cultural anthropologist working in a crazy place or an archaeologist, you know, digging in a swamp infested with crocodiles or, you know, but everybody's got stories. And so now I, I have a couple of good ones that I can pass along. That's, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, really a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the questions we have from um, Gaithia was, 
Have your experiences in the Ivory Coast, have they informed or changed your attitude towards being a STEM woman? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, so all of the places that I've worked in, um, there haven't really been any native or local women who are also involved in science. And so when I was in Peru, I was working under a female grad student. She's a um, she's Indian and she's a grad student at Washington University. Um, and so that was really, really fantastic. Um, but the general attitude towards women in Peru was not the most enlightened one. Um, and when I was in Kenya, I was the only woman in a group of um, a group of, you know, Kenyan um, paleoanthropologists and American paleoanthropologists. And the same thing here, I was all by myself, um, the only non-Ivorian, the only woman. Um, and so realizing how lucky I am to be um, in the United States where I'm surrounded by a bunch of like people who are excited about women in science, um, you know, that's been really fantastic. Um, and it's also made it really important to me to um, try and get other girls and women um, kind of the opportunity to be interested in science. So um, when I was in Cote d'Ivoire, I was working um, kind of out of one of the villages close to the, um, the field site. And I realized the girls there had never actually been into the forest. Um, so they live inside, they live literally right outside, right on the border of the rainforest. Um, and the only time that they've seen these monkeys is as people's pets. Um, and that's the only context that they really have for um, for primates. And so one of the things that I'd like to do when I go back to the field is um, give, you know, these like 12 year old girls an opportunity to come in and walk around the forest with me and see monkeys and see, you know, maybe we'll see snakes and it will be exciting. But, you know, um, having had the opportunities that I've had to go and do science and pretty much unimpeded as, you know, a white lady wandering around Central Africa or West Africa, um, I'd really like to have other people have that opportunity as well. Um, and, you know, maybe they wouldn't be interested in doing science anyways, but knowing that it's an option, I think, is a really important thing. Yeah, that's the main thing. We're not trying to force everyone to do STEM, but make it easy for them to do it if they wish to do it. Right. Um, moving on from your mom asking questions, I think we have a question from your dad. So <laughs> I love that this is a family Q&A. And that's he awesome. just said, ask her about the ants. So could you elaborate on that? <laughs> um, so I never realized how much I hate ants until I got to the Amazon. <laughs> um, and I really hate ants. Um, so there's a bunch of different kinds of ants, and they're all horrible. Um, but in Peru, there's this species of ant called bullet ants, or um, they call them isula locally. Um, but they're about, let's see, where's my camera? <laughs> they're about an inch long. Um, they have pinchers and they have stingers. Um, and so they like latch onto you with their pinchers and then they sting you repeatedly with their horrible venom. Um, and they're called bullet ants because it's supposed to feel um, like you've been shot and you're like nauseous for 24 hours and you're in horrible pain. And so um, there was always this like specter of bullet ants coming out of wherever you were. Um, I was lucky, I, was, I never got stung by bullet ants, but everybody that I was working with did. Um, and it was like they were coming for me because they hadn't gotten me yet, and it was horrible. Um, but there was one morning where we were out um, watching, you know, waiting for the monkeys to wake up, and I noticed um, there was this like thing kind of moving strangely on the forest floor, and I looked closer, and it was one of the little anole lizards. They're like, you know, four inch long little gecko guys. Um, and it was like twitching back and forth, kind of writhing strangely. And I realized that there was a bullet ant embedded in its like neck and it was stabbing it and stabbing it and stabbing it. And I was like, you know, if it causes humans to like vomit and pass out from pain, imagine what it's doing to this little four inch long, poor little lizard. And so ever since then, I've held a horrible grudge against ants. That's um, crazy. <laughs> also, I, I mean, we had um, army ants that they, so it's just these giant swarms of ants that move by the millions through um, sections of the rainforest, and they eat any, um, basically anything that they can find, they'll eat it. Um, and so they eat katydids and small mammals and small snakes and stuff if they can um, get over them in time. Um, and so they would like come through at night through our lab or through your house or through your tent. And um, I could go on about ants. 
because I really hate ants, but I will. <laughs> they're the worst. <laughs> this, it just reminds me of this movie I watched when I was young. It's from 1977 called Empire of the Ants. It's a horrible B-rate horror movie. But it's when, when you're telling me about this being in the Amazon, these crazy big ants just being predators, it reminds me of it. I'll put the link to the IMDb on there because it's a really bad movie. But I remember being a child and seeing these six-foot ants chasing people down and I think the Everglades, but that's this is what you're coming uh, coming through to me about, and that's that's nuts. The worst pred- story that I have: um, some people get cats for their um, research stations because the in the end, the mice get really really bad, um, and they so um, somebody I know got a kitten for their um, research station, and they would keep it in a little basket at night so that it wouldn't get eaten by snakes and so it wouldn't run away, um, and so one night. <laughs> The ants came through, um, and the cat was in its little basket, and um, so they, the next morning, opened the basket, and it was a little um, basket full of kitten bones, because the ants had literally just skeletonized the cat, Um, and so, (sighs) bad stuff. That's That's not a nice way to go. No. (laughs) And, and how long of a time period was this? I mean, they were probably, I think they, it can last anywhere from like a half hour to two hours, depending on how big the swarm of ants is. So it wasn't very long um, that they were able to skeletonize the kitten. That's crazy. Yeah. Hmm. I remember reading somewhere that you get these tribes that use bullet ants as part of their ritual. So they have mm-hmm. to endure being stung by the ant. Yeah. And it's a um, rite of passage type thing. Yeah. I'm glad that I am not part of that. (laughs) So we have a a couple more questions here for you, and I was just wondering, like, what do you think or what's the coolest project that you have done? What do you find the most interesting out of all the research that you've done? And I think maybe to follow up on that, is there something that you want to do that you haven't done yet? And, you know, really the big reason why, what really gets you going about it? Um. Well, I'm really invested in my dissertation research right now, obviously. Um, So I think that that project is super cool. And so I I mentioned it a little bit talking about the hormones and the isotopes, but basically um, the monkeys that I'm studying, these Diana monkeys, um, there's one male and a bunch of females and they're very territorial. They eat um, lots and lots of fruit. Um, And what we see is that there are big fights um, where territory overlaps. Um, And what's actually happened is that females um, will go and attack and kill females from a different group. Um, and you almost never hear about, you know, female violence and female kind of coalitionary killing. It's usually when you're thinking about primates doing this sort of thing, people talk about male chimpanzees and male spider monkeys, but females aren't really in the conversation about it. Um, so I want to, I think that that's a, a, you know, a giant piece missing from our story, especially if we're trying to use um, primate behavior to reconstruct evolution and, you know, why humans are violent. Well, you can't totally ignore, you know, half of humans and why female humans might be violent. Um, And so I think that's a really cool project. And so that's what I'll be working on. I'm leaving to do my field work starting in July. Um, And so that is, I'll be trying to figure out why females are attacking each other. Um, But the project, so my next idea for a project, this is what I wanted to do my dissertation research on originally is um, figuring out what male manga bees are up to. So um, in these groups of manga bees, there are like a hundred and some odd animals. They're really big groups. Um, and males kind of bounce between groups. So they're resident males, but then there are these extra visiting males who, um, they just sort of appear for a while and they mate with all the ladies and then they disappear again. <laughs> um, I think I've seen that in humans, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. There, there are a lot of parallels. Um, <laughs> and so the, the, the males... You know, sometimes they they stay for a while, sometimes they're just there for an afternoon. Um, And it's not clear where these males are coming from, how they're related to anybody in the group, if they're traveling really long distances, um, why you want to be a visiting male instead of a male who lives in a group and presumably always has access to the ladies. Um, And so um, I really want to do 
you know, figure out why and I want to be able to radio collar these extra group males and follow them around and see where they're going and see, um, you know, get a, a picture of paternity and whether or not these males are having equal reproductive success to the resident males and um, things of that nature. So that's my like my next big project, but I would need to be there for at least a year, you know, at least a full year and based on the political situation right now. I can't guarantee that I'll be able to be anywhere you know, in the Ivory Coast for a full year. So that's my like my postdoc project idea or something. Right. Like well, it, it's made me think, especially as a non-biologist, but I was just thinking about you know, if you're having this outside group coming in and needing to, I, I don't know, refresh the gene pool, if, if you're having this closed community, eventually you're going to have problems with repeated genes going through. So it, at least to me, again, as a non-biologist, at least this is what came up in my head, is if you're having an outside source of fresh genetic material coming in, coming in to produce more, I think it would help add diversity, at least genetically. Right. So from a population perspective, that makes total sense. But it's not clear what would make an ind I mean, individuals aren't, especially individual monkeys, aren't thinking what would be for the good of my population's gene pool, right? So there has to be some impetus for individuals to be doing that. And so it's not totally clear what that would be yet. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we have a couple more because we are doing awesome. Thank you, everybody, for your amazing comments and questions. Thank you to Erin's parents for jumping in and embarrassing her on, on the internet, which is oh, great. Good, good. Don't be embarrassed. Um, I think here, did, uh, Benuni, did, is there a couple other um, questions that you had? No, I think Erin covered pretty much everything we had, um, awesome. unless there's new questions coming up. Um, one question that I think would be good to finish on is, um, what advice would you have for young girls considering STEM careers and, you know, we hear a lot about how negative gender stereotyping can really damage their confidence and things like that. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to A, girls who are considering STEM careers and B, STEM educators to encourage um, these girls into pursuing their dreams? <laughs> um. I mean, the thing that helps me most as somebody who wanted to be a scientist was that um, I did see myself and other people who were doing science. And um, so um, primatology is unique in that we have a lot of really important female primatologists. And you know, the, any, any primatologist that people are going to know, Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall, and you know, you don't, you can't really think of any male primatologists off the top of your head. And so that's one reason that there are so many women in primatology is because we have these amazing role models. Um, but you can also see yourself in people that aren't women, obviously, right? So if I look at, you know, the research that my advisor is doing, he does stuff that I think is really cool. Um, and so even if it's not somebody who matches up with your gender or your skin color or your country of origin, you can always see yourself in people. And generally, if you can find a way to connect your interests to somebody else's interests, they'll be interested in helping you because, you know, from a selfish perspective, but also just because generally, if you're doing something that somebody thinks is cool, they want to help you do cool things. Um, and so I would totally recommend that if anybody is interested in STEM careers, you know, don't be afraid to contact people who are already involved in them because I can't think of a group of people who are more invested in having people, um, especially underrepresented people, um, continue to participate in, um, in science careers. Um, and as far as, you know, people who are STEM educators, I think the same thing goes. Um, you have to be supportive and excited about what your students are interested in. And um, I mean, my eighth grade science teacher, uh, Mr. Harris, when he found out I was really excited about Jane Goodall, took me to see Jane Goodall talk when she was at his um, alma mater. Um, and, you know, that's not something that you can arrange for everybody, but there, there are ways that are easy, especially now that we have the internet, you can always find some connection to help build. And so I would really, really hope that people are willing to help your students build those connections for themselves. No, oh, definitely, and especially since you brought up the internet. I think one amazing thing that that we've been able to cash in on, as it were, is the Google Plus has actually been a fantastic way to work with people from across the world in many different fields. I I don't typically work with people in biology, but since 
Google Plus has been around, I'm I'm able to speak with the three of you, you know, Rajni and both of you, on a fairly regular basis, and I. I wouldn't typically find myself in that situation, and to be able to share our experiences just working in the STEM fields alone. We, we don't necessarily share any of the same scientific goals with our own particular research, but we still have the same mindset, and I think that's important is realizing no matter where you are, no matter what your gender, who you love, you know where you're at, you're still able to go out and do amazing things in these STEM fields, that it's not based on who you are. It's based on what you want to accomplish. And I think that's a really big thing to remind everyone is that you have the ability to do all these amazing things regardless of who you are. Just go out there and do it. Absolutely. That's a really positive message and Google Plus has been great for bringing people like us together to allow that to happen. And yeah, I absolutely love the science community and the STEM community here on Google Plus because of that. Yeah, it, it's just been wonderful, and we've been have you know, especially with the the communities now. We're, we'll wait for it to calm down a bit, but <laughs> um, but we we have you know your circle that you guys curate. You know, this the STEM women on Google Plus. We have the the science on Google Plus public database. We have many different circles that are going around. Allows us to find what we're interested in. Whether you're a scientist or not, you can at least get in touch with a scientist and find out what what excites the scientists, not necessarily the science, because sometimes the science can be a little confusing, but we're all people at the end of the day. And we all can at least connect on that very personal basis of what gets you excited about your field. Yeah, and I'm happy to, to ramble about monkeys to anybody who really <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm just checking the comments here real quick. Um, let's see here if we have anything else coming up before we sign off. All right, well, while you're doing that, I should take the opportunity to thank Budini and Rajni and Scott and everybody for watching because this is, I've had a lot of fun um, and it was a great opportunity and I really appreciate that you guys asked me to participate. So, thank yeah, you. thank you for joining us. You've been an awesome guest and thanks, Scott, for filling in for Rajni as well, last minute. No, you're very welcome. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing a comment here from Lizzie. Um, I. I'm sorry if I mess up your last name, Barub for Barube. Um, she says, Aaron, your comment that showing um, an interest will create interest in your research is so true, but also continuing to be enthusiastic about your work helps to find enthusiasm from others in your circles at conferences and reflects in all you write. So I think it's important to show your enthusiasm regardless of what you're doing, and it will help connect other people that are maybe not as enthusiastic as you, but you, it rubs off on people. It really does when you're working with people, whether it be on Google Plus in the virtual environment or in Meet Space, as I call it, you know, at conferences, your enthusiasm is contagious and it does really affect everyone around you. Yeah, that's been something that I've really appreciated from teaching. So like I said, I teach an intro to physical anthropology class um, and I have 50 general ed students who have no real interest in anthropology, but inevitably people get really excited about the primate stuff because I get really excited about the primate stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's even if what you do seems a little bit esoteric or silly or strange or what, what have you, um, you know, your enthusiasm about it is, is what's going to carry other people's enthusiasm. So that's a really good point for, I don't, from Liz. So. Yeah, absolutely, because that we, we really need that context because especially when you're doing a PhD project, you know, stretches out over several years, you're looking at a tiny thing to do with a tiny thing to do with a tiny thing. Your point of view is so focused. When you kind of raise your head, you're like, oh, does anyone care about this? And it helps to talk to people and hear questions from people and know that, oh, people do care. What I do matters, and I think that's the great part about communities like this, that you're not alone in your research, you're not alone in your enthusiasm, and what you do matters. It does matter. And I, I know to me, again, I'm not in your field, I'm more in physics and astronomy, but this is really interesting, and it's important to show that science is important regardless which flavor of it that you're doing. Um, it, it's it really brings out the humanity in us that we can be curious and go down different paths for the same end of just trying to figure out something we didn't know yesterday. 
is pushing back that horizon a little further. Now we know just a little bit more, a little bit more, or maybe just add some context to what we already know. I think that's really important. And that, that enthusiasm that we have allows people to risk doing that, risk going into the unknown. Um, I, I've seen a lot where people are just terrified of failing. And yeah, failure is something that does hang in the back of your head, but you have to risk failing to find out something new. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I think we've um, pretty much covered all the questions and everything we could hope to ask Erin. But if you do have further questions that you think of when you're watching a replay of this, feel free to leave it on the event page and we'll get around to it because all of us are active on Google+. Plus. We're interested in spreading um, being evangelical about science, not just today, but um, for the long term. So leave your questions at the events page and we'll cover that even later. And thank you everyone for tuning in to watch this. This was awesome and Gardening Guy has stopped so that's the hotel too. <laughs> is there anything you want to add, Erin, before no, we sign um, off? No, I think this is this has been great and thanks everybody for watching and happy December. And happy first night of Hanukkah. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> So uh, quick shameless plugs out there, uh, as Chad Haney has pointed out. Uh, we have Science Sunday, which everyone can go and take a look at. So on every Sunday that's out there, people are sharing any sort of field with science. And just use the hashtag Science Sunday. We also have the circle there for Science Sunday. And I believe now the community as well. That, and without forgetting as well, we have the STEM women on G+. So it really helps celebrate the, the women that are doing amazing things in all the different fields that are out there. Uh, this is the month of December, so throughout the entire 12th month of 2012, we will be doing all sorts of different um, hangouts on air, discussions, Q&As with people like CERN. We've had Nat Geo, um, the San Diego Zoo. Uh, we uh, will be having some with the NASA Dawn mission going on Further. This is all associated with Google Science Fair and Girl Start, which is a K through 12 program out of Austin, Texas, that is trying to get um, girls from K through 12 interested in the STEM fields and just realizing that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, STEM is for everybody. And it's not just for one side or the other, no matter what political lines that you're on, it's for everybody. And we all have the ability of doing that. So thank you everyone for showing up and your amazing comments and questions. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing with your research. And, uh, and Budini, thank you for, again for inviting me along to help you guys yeah. out. This was awesome. Thanks for joining. And one more um, quick um, mention. On Monday, Chad will be doing a MRI hangout of a live beating heart and talking about the technology that it takes to image um, a beating heart, which I think is pretty awesome and definitely a first for a Google Plus Hangout on Air. So there's an event page um, on Chad's page for that, and STEM women will be promoting that as well. So make sure you check that out. It's on Monday um, coming up. So that should be definitely fun to watch as well. Yep, I'll make sure to put it in the link of their event page too so everyone knows about it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for watching, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this. I'm going to end the broadcast. All right, good night. Okay, good night. Bye, Bye. everyone.